this color blue has a little bit of meaning to me as well. My mom had very striking blue eyes. And I knew my dad was going to be in a dark place. And we always talked about getting a dog. And we never did it. And I said, I think now's the moment. I want to surprise my father with a dog. And I got a Siberian Husky with the exact same color eyes. Wow. The, the Siberian Husky became a part of our family. Yeah. And we felt like a part of my mom's spirit was within her. And it's probably a little bit of hyperbole to say, but it's true. I think she definitely saved his life during that time because she encouraged him to stay active, to walk, to go outside of the house, to for me and him to talk about it. Yeah. And um, when I was looking at this watch, I was like, wow, this is the color of those eyes that have meant so much to me throughout That's wonderful. my life. And yeah. again, most people <laughs> see a shiny watch and they think shiny watch, but I always see a little bit more. All right, Dr. Mike, thanks for joining us in Talking Watches today. I've been really excited to have you for a while now. I'm really excited. This is my first video talking about watches, so. That's amazing for all the videos that you've made. Yeah. Uh, we, we've seen the watches on your wrist, but you've never spoken about them. Exactly. So they've been there, they're part of the background, but now it's time to hear the background story. For those in our audience who somehow don't know who you are, can you give us a little bit of background on who is Dr. Mike? I'm a board certified family medicine doctor. So half the week I'm practicing in an outpatient setting, meaning like you're coming in to a clinic to see a doctor, you don't know what's wrong with you, you have an urgent problem, I'm the person you would see. And in addition to that, I also manage one of the biggest medical platforms in the world these days, kind of surreal to say, but across social media, we have almost 25 million subscribers where we put out accurate evidence-based information to help demystify what's going on with our bodies, help boost health literacy, but at the same time, beat up on misinformation because there's a ton of it. And can you tell us where we're filming this episode? This is my podcast studio where we film the Checkup Podcast, uh, speaking with influential individuals in the medical space, celebrity space, political space about their health, about the future of health. So if you're interested uh, to learn more about your body and what can happen next time you end up in a hospital, check it out. All right, so I'm sitting in the same seat as influential people. That's The good. Surgeon General was in that seat not too long ago. Okay, all right, the same seat <laughs> as the Surgeon General. You never know what can happen on Talking Watches. So what takes you from medical school, residency, and then, and then here we are? Yeah, it's a very strange route, something that I did not plan for. If you ask me 10 years ago when I finished medical school what my plans would be, it was not this. Sure. But... The way that it all happened was surreal in that I was making content on social media very passively, just sharing my life of what it's like to be a med student. And I went viral. Didn't expect that to happen either, yeah. uh, especially for the reasons that it did. I thought it would be that I was the youngest doctor in my hospital, the fact that I did research, but it was all for superficial reasons. Okay. <laughs> um, BuzzFeed wrote like, check out this sexy doctor. Yeah. People Magazine put me on their Sexiest Man Alive issue. And I thought yeah. that there was so much value I could bring when it comes to talking about people's health, beating up misinformation, teaching folks how to live not in, with an anti-aging mindset, but with an aging well mindset. I think that's very powerful. Sure. And we did that on YouTube with tremendous success. There was an appetite for it, if done well and responsibly. And now six years into making content, I think we have a, a proven concept here. So I wanna go back in time a bit. When in your life did watches sort of enter the picture? Is this something that came as you saw success or is it something that dates back to childhood? It started very early in childhood. I actually came to the United States at the age of six. Okay. My father was a doctor back in Russia and had to go through the medical school process here again. Uh, we were very poor when we came to the States. We lived on welfare. I still remember uh, to this day going with my grandfather to the welfare office to pick up cereal because we couldn't afford the Lucky Charms and all these cereals that you would get in a store. That was a big exciting moment in my life. Equally as exciting, just a couple of years later, uh, me and my father would take the subway from Brooklyn into the city and go to Canal Street and look at all the vendors selling watches. Granted, this isn't the fanciest experience, nor uh, are the watches usually, sure. um, the watches are usually knockoffs, but it was what we could afford at the time. And it was cool to be able to see the variety of watches that existed. I saw my father's passion for it. 
Um, I saw how he would save and get excited about the watches. So I started learning. And I watched him, I remember, purchase one of like the higher end knockoffs, if you will. Uh-huh. Again, it's pretty funny that we're talking about knockoffs. Yeah. But that's the reality we lived in. That was the only thing available to us. And he bought one of these like Porsche design watches. And I would look at it and say, oh, it's a chronograph. It's sporty. This is so cool. And it's probably why I'm <laughs> very yeah, it drawn to speaks, chronographs. Yeah, it definitely speaks to what you have for sure. It started there, and then it seemed like it was a bonding moment for me and my father, where we would both use this as a time to be together, to talk about our passions, and celebrate big achievements and accomplishments. And it started off with my father buying me um, a high school present of a Seiko Kinetic watch. Mm -hmm. I think I remember the model. It was a Seiko Arctura. Okay. So like this is like... Older, older watch, but uh, definitely one that I was super passionate to have. I, I read the manual over and over again. Yeah, that's when you know you really. <laughs> I think you <laughs> might need to on watches like that. Too, yeah, for to sure. really know how they work. But that, yeah. that's amazing. Do you still have that watch? I still have that watch. It's in my childhood home. Yeah, and uh, that watch is never going anywhere. So, at what point in the journey to, you know, graduating medical school, entering the field, was this something that early on you were already, you know, looking at buying watches, or was this something that happened later. I always wanted to get into the hobby of collecting watches for real, like start expanding my collection. Uh, But at the same time, I always wanted to make sure that I translated my success to my father, to pass that along to him. Because I wouldn't be where I am today without him. He brought me to the United States, picked up his life in his 40s, came to a new country, learned a new language, redid medical school and residency, things I can't imagine redoing again 10 years from now in a different yeah. language. And he did that all in the hopes that I would have success. So I wanted to make sure that he felt that he was successful in that. And I feel like watches have been a great uh, staple in our relationship to continue that. When I uh, graduated uh, medical school, there was a watch that he had, a uh, Zenith watch that's actually here today, the El Primero. And I would always take this from him to wear out with my friends <laughs> without him knowing. Yeah. And he knew how much I liked this watch. I think it was like my first love where it combined the very classical, beautiful suit watch with elements of skeleton, open right. work design. And I, I just was obsessed with this. And he passed it along to me and I knew in the back of my head that he's making a really good choice here because not only am I going to wear it a lot, appreciate it a lot, but I'm going to return the favor and get him some beautiful watches in the coming years as well. And that's part of the reason why I work so hard uh, making all this content, working in the hospital. And, yeah. and the journey has been uh, very interesting. So where does it go from this Zenith in your sort of collecting path? My first probably high-end watch purchase was my stainless steel Royal Oak chronograph there beautiful watch. The fact that I was even able to get it um, was really exciting. I remember in 2019 in Art Basel, um, I went to go see their collections and I told them how passionate I was about watches, shared some of the stories uh, with my father. And they said, well, we'd love to welcome you to our collection. And this was the the first one that I got. And I mean, it's timeless. That's that's never going to change. How do you go from admiring your father's zenith to now suddenly visiting with AP at at Art Basel. How how do we get there? Yeah, so when I look at Zenith and why I'm a big fan of their brand is that their movements are top notch, but also their design has been really smart. There's not one Zenith watch that I look at and say, oh, this is terribly designed. Sure. Audemars, I've also felt the same way about. And I also saw some similarities (laughs) between my trajectory as well as Audemars in that they've had a lot of firsts. You know, they had the first skeleton watch. They had the first luxury sports uh, watch in the Royal Oak, ultra thin, which I'm a big fan of thin watches. And I was like, well, I was the first doctor to sort of do social media yep. in the way that I'm doing it. So I saw like the fact that I was a trailblazer in what I was doing. And I felt that AP was a, a trailblazer in their own right. So historically, I was tied to the brand, mm-hmm. aesthetically, movements, mechanically. And I don't regret it one bit because I think it's one of the best designers out there and they have some of the cleanest presentations. And that's not just talking about the Royal Oak because as you can see, I'm also um, a Code 1159 fan here. I think this is a 
a watch that looks very different in real life than it does in a photograph. When I first saw the collection on Instagram, on pictures, I was like, oh, this is cool. I want to see it in person. And then when you see how the, the crystal is shaped, you see that there's historic elements of uh, the, the side of the case having remnants of the royal oak being there. The, the case back being open. There's just, there's a lot of beauty to this watch that's understated. I think it's hard to grasp how this watch moves with the light, how the dial changes. Um, it's literally one, it become one of my favorite watches. And again, not something I would expect to say because this isn't their flagship model. But I think it goes to show that you need to not just be locked into what the mold is, what everyone else is doing. And when you do that, you can have some really cool passions and hobbies develop as a result. So you got a Royal Oak Chrono, you've got an 1159, but I also see another Zenith here. Uh, and it happens to have the high beat movement just like flying around yes. the dial. How does the Zenith enter the collection? I, I, I love Zenith. I think that their designs are just so clean. Uh, also, the fact that it has the high beat movement, I mean, one one hundredths of a second yep. on a mechanical watch. Um, I, I love the mechanics of a perpetual calendar, the fact that we can set it, and if you wind it, you can forget it. But this is really cool in that I've become an athlete myself, so it's cool to have a very functional, usable sport watch. Plus, it doesn't hurt that it looks really great with scrubs. Yeah, okay. And it, <laughs> it makes it easy to wear yeah. in the hospitals. <laughs> Do you wear that at the hospital most often, would you say? Um, I, the sporty ones I wear most often. Yeah. Uh, the Zenith, uh, I like wearing in the hospital the most. I feel like it's the, one of the more sturdy watches that I have. I do get nervous wearing the APs, especially something funny that I noticed wearing nice watches. I like to shadow box a lot randomly. In the I, hospital? Anywhere. Okay. <laughs> this is like something that happens when you start training. Yeah. It just starts coming out and you start shadow boxing. But when you have an automatic watch, on, you got to be careful. Yeah. Um, you know, most people think about it from a golfing standpoint. You got to be careful when you're golfing. I don't golf. But when you're throwing fast punches, you're also kind of abusing the mechanism there. Sure. So I have to uh, remind myself to be easy with some of these watches. And for I those who don't know, you're shadow boxing for a reason. You're not just like randomly punching the air. Yeah, yeah. Like when I was in medical school, uh, my father and I had a difficult time because I lost my mom and he lost his wife uh, to cancer. And so that was a tough time for me. I was in a dark place. I wasn't taking care of myself, which is something I should be doing because I want to lead by example for my patients. And I said, I need, to, um, I need to get out there and get moving again. And that's the first step of becoming healthy. And I took a, a group on boxing class and uh, I fell in love with boxing. I fell in love with the outlet of being able to be exercising, but at the same time moving, avoiding getting hit. And I was doing it more for fitness at that time and mental health clarity, but I stuck with it. And then in the age that we find ourselves in where boxing has now allowed YouTubers to enter the space, yeah. I said, whoa, I've been doing this. Why don't I start boxing sure. and, and do this legitimately? So I had my uh, boxing debut on Creator Clash, a sold out 10,000 person arena in Tampa, Florida and uh, had a big win, so I was very excited about that. And then before you know it, Showtime pay-per-view is calling and saying, really? hey, do you want to fight on the Anderson Silva undercard? And I'm like, whoa, how did we go from yeah, yeah, boxing yeah. and YouTube to being a professional, getting clearances and doing it legitimately? And I said, yeah, I, I want to do this. I want to challenge myself. So I took on an experienced uh, MMA fighter uh, with 20 plus fights from Nate Diaz's camp by the name of Chris Avila. Didn't get the win in my professional boxing okay. debut, lost by judge's decision. But I think I showed that um, doctors have heart. We're not scared to get in there and uh, show what we're made of. And uh, my boxing journey isn't just done yet. I, I mean, think. Rocky didn't win his professional debut either. That's that's what I'm saying. You know, So I, I think... Uh, I'm not going to retire 0 and 1 as a professional. Yeah. I'll put it that way. Good. So, do you remember what watch you wore after your win? I wore my Patek uh, Aquanaut. What a great segue. An yeah. accidental segue. Yeah. I was eyeballing that watch, <laughs> went for it, and here we are. Yeah, I, I remember wearing this watch. And the reason I remember wearing it is because after the fight, my dad was obviously very nervous. I had some 
bruising on my face. Yeah. He's a doctor as well. So he's like, oh my God, are you okay? <laughs> and uh, I still have the video of me going up and celebrating with him the win in the room afterwards. And I gave him the boxing gloves that I used in the fight. And I had these gloves made and I gave it to him to commemorate the moment. And I remember I was wearing this watch. And I think this is a great watch for a boxer to have. Yeah. It feels very flexible. That's kind of the, the big shout out I would give to the Patek watches in that they probably wear the most comfortable out of all the watches. The design, the way that it sits on the wrist, maybe it's because of the way my wrist is shaped, but by far the most comfortable watch I have that I can easily wear and not even realize that I'm wearing it for long periods of time. And what were the circumstances that you were able to acquire this into your collection? Um, I started following, once I started getting into Odd Mars, a lot of watch pages. So you were going deep. I was going deep. Yeah. I was really looking at what people were wearing and I, I realized that I needed to add a little color to my collection. I realized that I was really falling into this blue, silver, yeah. black kind of uh, monotone pattern. And every time I would see this watch, I, I remember there was like a few soccer players that were wearing it. I'm like, that's the watch I want, but obviously really hard to get, really expensive. So I said, when we have some success on the YouTube channel, we'll, we'll get that. Yeah. And that was a watch that I actually got when we hit 2 billion views on the YouTube channel. Wow. And that's 2 billion long form views. Yeah. Um, it's a lot those different. Those are real, than, real views. Yeah, those are views that uh, people are watching, you know, for t 10 minutes yeah. at the very least. So that's powerful to be able to have that kind of impact on the world. And for myself, I thought I would uh, get this beautiful watch to celebrate. Do you wear it fairly often? I mean, it, lo it looks like it, to be honest. Like it's which, which, it, well, as it should. You know, that's funny. A lot of my friends will see my watches like, dude, you like scratch up your watch. Watches are made to be there you scratched, go. Thank you. Yes. worn. And obviously, look, look, I love wearing my little holy grail ceramic perpetual yeah. calendar there because it never gets scratched. Right. And that's beautiful. But I feel like just like, I don't know, if you get like a hard shell suitcase and it gets all these scratches from you traveling all the time, that's like indicative of the fact Those that you like used it. Those are like stories of travel. Those are yeah. stories of travel. Yeah. That's how life has been experienced. And that's why, funny, I tie everything back to health, but why I'm so anti-aging. Anti yeah. The whole premise that people are pushing the world that now you can stop aging. First of all, you can't. So on, on the outset, it's a lot. Let's get that out of the way. Yeah, let's get that out of the way. It's like The watch is actually proving that for you. The seconds are going forward. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. The, the watch is yeah. the ultimate testament yeah. to anti-aging yeah. not working. And I don't view aging as a disease, just how I don't view scratches on the watches as a problem. So I know that's probably a little bit heavy. No, no, I mean, but that's... It, it does again, like get us into the ceramic watch though. And I, and you know, this is one of those, it's the other perpetual calendar on the table. This is like when you know you're deep for sure. <laughs> yeah, this for... is like not just perpetual calendar, but it's like ceramic perpetual calendar. This is when you're, you're clearly full on in the AP zone. How long have you had this watch? What's the story behind it? You know, what memories are baked into it? That's uh, that's the 10 million watch. Yeah. That's the watch that really commemorates the moment where you get your diamond plaque on YouTube. So when we started passing the likes of ABC News and Fox News on, on YouTube, we said, I, I have to commemorate, I have to do something special. And what I love about the ceramic watch is that it's one of those, if you know, you know. Yeah. No one's gonna come out on the street and say, wow, you're wearing such an expensive watch, you're so flash. It's strictly insider watch yep. so that if someone starts talking about it, you know that they're deep as well. And actually the last conversation that really uh, got me going with that watch was uh, I was at an event with Chris Hemsworth and he was also wearing an Odd Mars at the time. Yeah. And he's like, dude. And I'm like, yeah, well, dude. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So uh, it was truly, if you know, you know, and yeah. that's how we started chatting about uh, watches and then it transformed to talking about fighting and boxing and UFC. And um, that was a connection that we made very quickly. Before we get to, to this watch, I want to talk about the, this AP. Yeah, so I'm kind of uh, following my recency bias yeah. here and, and wearing this beautiful limited one of 100 watch here from AP where I was always, always a fan of the Royal Oak, simple, clean design here. Um, not even chronograph, which is unusual for right. me. And especially having it in this color, wow. I mean, the blue is just stunning. 
It's my favorite color blue. And this color blue has a little bit of meaning to me as well. My mom had very striking blue eyes. And I knew my dad was going to be in a dark place. And we always talked about getting a dog. And we never did it. And I said, I think now's the moment. I want to surprise my father with a dog. And I got a Siberian Husky with the exact same color eyes. Wow. The, the Siberian Husky became a part of our family. Yeah. And we felt like a part of my mom's spirit was within her. Yeah. The, the same look that my mom would give us, the dog would give us. And uh, it was a very positive outlet for us. She's still around to this day. She's 13 years old. And she's a tripod now because, unfortunately, she lost one yeah. of her legs. But she's still happy. She's still running around, bringing my father tons of joy. And it's probably a little bit of hyperbole to say, but it's true. I think she definitely saved his life during that time because she encouraged him to stay active, to walk, to go outside of the house, to for me and him to talk about it. Yeah. And um, when I was looking at this watch, I was like, wow, this is the color of those eyes that have meant so much to me throughout That's wonderful. my life. And yeah. again, most people <laughs> see a shiny watch and they think shiny watch, but I always see a little bit more. And I, I think that's the meaning you should look for when you're That's really to get special. A watch. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'd be remiss not to look at the watch that is most dissimilar from everything else on the table. <laughs> yes. And I don't know where it fits in in the timeline. Yep. But I'd love to talk about it. Yeah. So the Defy Extreme. Yeah. The it's, biggest it's very, watch. It's very, very extreme. It's very extreme. It's, I think it's like 46 or 47 millimeters. It's a huge watch for my wrist. It's proudly a thousand meters water resistant. <laughs> I've never been that deep, yeah. not planning to go that deep. But this was at a time when me and my father were really going in on watches. That's the one watch here, actually, that he's purchased me. Because this watch was his watch that right. he gave me. And this watch, when I went into medical school, he said, like, when you're going to have the success throughout medical school and all that, I want you to wear this watch. And I absolutely wore this watch a lot, as you can see. It yeah. has a lot of wear throughout medical school. And... Uh, it's a special watch because of that. That's never going anywhere, even though I will say out of uh, the collection, it's probably aged the most in terms of design. But um, I, I just think it's unique. And I think it's always nice to have a unique watch that means something to you. So what are some of the watches that are not here that have become a part of your father's collection because of you? So when I became part of uh, the Odd Mars family, if you will, by uh, getting some of those watches, I, uh, I surprised him with a Royal Oak offshore carbon fiber model uh, used because I was just starting out on my career and uh, I couldn't start getting him new watches at that moment. But my dad likes big watches, as you can tell from yeah. that design. He loves big watches. He has a big wrist. He's a bigger guy. And uh, when I got that for him, it was a very touching moment between us because we, we've gone through a lot together in life. And it was, it was a special moment to be able to give that back to him. So I said, for his birthday, I'm going to give him a surprise. I happened to be on a billboard in Times Square to encourage people to get vaccinated. And he didn't know. And I took him to Times Square and I showed him where the ball drops, where we came in 1995 and we saw that ball drop because we came in December 1995 and then saw the ball drop. His son is on that billboard. It's amazing. But the surprise wasn't over. Right. We then took an Uber, he, not knowing where he's going, uh, to the Audemars store not too far away. And uh, I surprised him with his very own Royal Oak chronograph. Wow. And uh, very similar to mine here, but with uh, a silver face. And he was like, initially, he my father follows the same pattern every time. When I got the Siberian Husky Roxy, He's like, no, this isn't, this is not, we can't have a dog right now. He's very angry at me. He's yelling, doing his traditional Soviet Russian father uh -huh. thing. And then he breaks down and starts crying and telling me how much he loves the dog. Yeah. And that we should come up with a good name together. Same thing happened, like one to one. We walk into the Audemars store. He's like, why are we here? Come on, this is ridiculous. You know, we can't afford this, it's too much. And we already had the watch waiting for him. There was a little bit of champagne, got him some cupcakes. And the waterworks started coming, and yep. his tough Soviet exterior came down very quickly. That, Still have pictures from that day. That it's is really, really, really great. Yeah. That's so I, I mean, I'm I'm very blessed to be yeah, able to do this, of course. and um, I find myself lucky, and that's why I always try and give back, not just to my father, but in in every way that I can. Uh, my boxing matches, because I'm a professional fighter, I was getting paid, but each one of my matches, I donated my entire purse to charity. So my first fight, I gave it to the conflict that was going on in Ukraine. 
My second fight I gave to the Harlem Boys and Girls Club here in New York City um, to the tune of $125,000. And I continue to try and lead the way by showing people that the, the, the success and financial success even at that comes from the fact that you love what you do and when you align your passions with your skill set. And now I'm working at a community health center. I don't work as a concierge doctor for the rich and famous. That's never been the goal. So three days a week, I'm helping people who need help. Yeah. Half of my patients are on charity care where they're not paying anything to come see me. And I would have it no other way where I think it's cool that we live in a capitalistic society that allows us the chance to come as immigrants and have this level of success, but at the same time be able to give back so that others have the same opportunity. Sure. Looking at your collection, there is not vintage on the table. Is there any reason behind that? And I, I might venture to guess one, but I'd like to hear from you why. why yeah, for me, uh, it's been initial excitement about being able to get something new yeah. that's meaningful to me. Um, but there will absolutely be vintage watches in the collection. It's, it's about forming those relationships and finding uh, a story that you tie to. And I've yet to find that. But uh, when I do, I want it to be special. I want it to be something unique that I think ties into what we've accomplished. So uh, there will absolutely be one, but not yet because uh, I needed to build up the core. And I feel like now I'm at a really good, happy spot for a core of uh, starting a collection. As someone who's entrenched in social media and for sure Instagram has changed the dynamic of watches and how watches are perceived and how taste is created and it can sometimes tell someone that taste is one thing and you can only buy th these three watches. Sure. And what would your advice be to those that may now view you and see your collection or, or fellow enthusiasts out there that are sort of stuck in that mold? So I think social media carries both pros and cons and we have to point those out honestly. And I think one of the cons is we fall into this compare and contrast culture. What does this person have that I don't have? And that leads to a lot of dissatisfaction and unhappiness. So when you're starting your watch collection or thinking about purchasing a watch, it has to be for you, not for everybody else. And I think the most clear example of that is the fact that I've been on social media for 10 years now, very proudly, loudly posted a lot. I've never done a watch video. Right. I've never posted my watches showing off my collections and showing off why I got them. The, in fact, the fact that I'm doing this is a testament that I very much respect how you talk about watches. And um, I hope people really take that to heart and get a watch that means something for them. And the, the, it's the same reason why I've even gifted some of my friends watches uh, for meaningful occasions because I know that that's going to be a meaningful part of their life uh, moving forward, even though People think it's the price tag that comes with it. And certainly there's an aspect to that. Look, when you get something rare and expensive, it's nice. But it, it, it's the moments that happen around it that really make it special. What is the watch you see most on fellow doctors? Um, I think the classic watch that doctors wear is the Rolex. Yeah. And, you know, is it the day date? Is it the date just? Uh, hard to say because doctors have different preferences. But I still remember to this day when I was a med student, you're not allowed to wear a watch when you perform surgery. So when the doctors would scrub in, they would have to remove their watch. And they would give it to someone they only trust. And when I was a student and I was rotating through these different surgical sites, I made friends with some of the doctors talking about my passions for watches. Yeah. They don't oftentimes see a med student who knows what a Zenith is and is excited about it. So I remember one of the doctors gave me his Daytona to hold on to because I wasn't allowed to scrub in. And I remember wearing it. I'm like, oh, this is the one Rolex that I feel like in the future, I really want to make sure I get my hands on. Yeah. And I've yet to do that. Why so, is that? Um, circumstances, mostly. Yeah, yeah. Um, but also initially when I was looking at watches, it seemed like all my friends just talked about Rolexes and they viewed it as a status symbol as opposed to their true passion for it. And that may have gave me some reservation initially, but absolutely there's going to be a Rolex in the future in one of my collections. You might you might need to go after a Zenith Daytona, you know? Yeah, that, just, would, that just would be cool from like much a, more perfect. vintage. Yeah. And have you ever used any mechanical watch for any medical purpose? Well, absolutely. Um, even... When I'm a family medicine doctor, so I see people of all ages in my practice. And part of what I do is uh, timing people's pulses and uh, respiratory rate. 
becomes even more important when you're seeing a, a young baby who is sick with COVID, with other viruses that are circulating. And part of my exam needs to be, is the respiratory rate normal? And every time I put my stethoscope on a baby's chest, I'm not just timing and listening to their uh, heart rate, I'm also making sure that I get the respiratory rate. And it's nice to have a beautiful watch to look at. Yeah, <laughs> that's good to know because I know people don't realize that we still use these watches as tools. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there have been times where I've been lazy and I didn't wear my watch for a while and I put it on and I rush out the door. And I'm like, great, I'm wearing a, a mechanical piece of uh, timekeeping that is not telling me the accurate time because I didn't set it. So that, that absolutely happens. Yeah. And uh, I think that's the the cool part about human life. Again, I'm going to get so philosophical yeah. here, but it's like the fact that you have to set it and sometimes it's not set is cool. That like imperfection makes it valuable. And you would never think to say that. And I'm seeing that cycle kind of repeat itself with EVs and electric cars coming out where, yeah, they're, they're faster. Their, their acceleration is through the roof. Their power is instant. And yet there's something still beautiful about an engine roaring, you know, granted environmental impacts and all, but there's something about that imperfection yeah. that is still uh, very much human. I agree. I think that's what ties so much of the enthusiasm to watches is the imperfection. It's yeah. not about the most accurate timekeeping. It's about on occasion turning the watches over and seeing how they're put together. And the fact that every watch on this table as much as you can continue to beat this defy up, yeah. we'll still be here, yep. you know, 50, 100 years from now. Yeah. And again, they don't have to be, if you beat it up enough, they don't have to be watches that you wear for timekeeping purposes. They could be something that you're displaying as proud mementos yeah. of the steps that you've taken to get here. I remember uh, Nike hired me for a project and they brought me to Beaverton to look at their facilities and they had every one of the first uh, editions of the Jordans yeah. in the Jordan building. And I was looking at it, I'm like, that's what I can do with watches. Yeah, it's true. Where you're watching the watching the, the stepwise progression of your career. And I've always fallen in love with that as corny as it sounds. I mean, that's what's, no, it's what's amazing for me to be able to sit down with anyone in these episodes is now, I saw these watches before we started filming and I look at them 100% differently yeah. now that we're done. Because each one of them has a different memory tied to it where it doesn't matter if you're wearing it or displaying it, the memory remains. Yep, that's absolutely true. And funny that we do that as humans. We tie things, uh, memories, meaningful moments to physical objects. Yeah. But um, as long as we keep doing that, I think watches are gonna be uh, quite successful I as think an so industry. Too. Yeah. And look, we're aging and <laughs> yeah. this will keep us immortal, <laughs> yeah. you know? Exactly. Yeah. Yep. All right, Dr. Mike, thank you very much for uh, joining us on Talking Watches. Thank you so much. Yeah. As always, uh, like I say in my YouTube videos, stay happy and healthy. All right, love it. <laughs>